question. Dear colleagues, today I want to speak with you about the narrow complex tachycardia. We want to discuss about the development and approach, review treatment and options, and disposition decisions. SVT or supraventricular tachycardia is a broad umbrella for any tachycardia originated above the ventricle. There are variable underlying mechanisms, but basically on the therapeutic approach. It ranges from physiological to pathological and from benign to dangerous. It can occur in all age groups and the clinical presentation can be asymptomatic, symptomatic, heart failure or shock. Why should we care? Disability and mortality. Patient gets discomfort and anxiety. In 15%, patient can get syncopal events, and there's a little risk of sudden cardiac death because of the axillary pathway driven arrhythmias. And the tachycardia can mediate a cardiomyopathy by LV dilatation or impaired LV function. How should we approach the tachycardia? The most important question is, is the patient stable or not? So look at the airway breathing circulation parameters, look at the monitor, there should be a crash card to the bedside. Is the QRS narrow or wide? Is it regular or irregular? And look at the P wave. Is there a relationship between the QRS? Look at the P wave X and look at the P-wave morphology, or are there more than one morphologies? Is there an other ECG to compare? And do you have a clue about the trigger or the underlying cause? It is not always black or white if a patient is stable or not. A patient can be stable, but get unstable in time. So look at the patient. You should look at the big picture, look at the symptoms, signs, and vitals. Cardiorespiratory reserve, age, other comorbidities. Be prepared. Any dysrhythmia could potentially deteriorate, and all therapies are potentially pro arrhythmic. Is the QRS narrow or wide? In adults, we speak about wide when it's more than. 120 milliseconds and in kids if it is more than 80 milliseconds. Is it regular or irregular? Sometimes you can see that it's irregular, but not always. So use a caliper or a paper. Irregular rhythms originate above the AV node, but in small cases when the PT is getting and faster, it can also be irregular. Step 4 is look at the P waves. As my teacher said, chercher le P. So, is there a P wave? And where is the P wave? Is it before or after the QRS complex? And what is the relationship between the P and the QRS? And what is the P wave rate at the ventricular rate? Is the P wave coming from the SA node? Is there one P wave morphology or more than one? If you have difficulties, use 50 mm per second ECG tracings that will help you. In a study, 45 ECGs of narrow complex tachycardia were printed and given to a physician. After two weeks, the same ECGs were also printed in 25 and 50 mm per second paper and asked to give the diagnosis and treatment. The results were in 50 mm per second. The diagnostic accuracy increased from 62 to 71 percent. Final categorization. Narrow complex tachycardia. Look, it is it regular with these or irregular fees. Look to regular without fees or irregular without fees.
that can give you information about the underlying rhythm disorder. If it is a wide complex tachycardia, then also look at other sites of Brugada. Also look at underlying causes. And then nonic is his depth. Hypoxia, ischemia, sympathetic excess, drugs, electrolytes, pericardia, tumor disease, and stretch. Indeed, a uh, nice uh, mnemonic. Thank you. Uh, if you look at the clinical presentations, patients can have symptoms. Most of them are palpitation, dizziness, display, fatigue, chest pain, diaphoresis, nausea, and neck pounding is said to be pathognomic. Let's discuss a case. A 27-year-old male with palpitations and dyspnea. It's a narrow complex tachycardia with 160 beats uh, per minute on ECG. Also, he tells you that he has been hissing like a horse. So you question yourself, does he have diabetic? Or is that normal with SPT? We can see polyuria in supraventricular tachycardia because there's a lot of AV synchronization. Atrial contraction is against closed AV valve. Because of that, you can get elevated atrial pressure and atrial stretch. And because of that, the atrial natriuretic peptide is elevating and then you can get polyuria. The next case is of a, a three-month-old female with dyspnea and wheezing. The temperature is 40.5 degrees. The pulse is 190 beats per minute and the systolic blood pressure is 60 millimeters mercury and the saturation is 88%. There is a moderate respiratory distress on exam with wheezing and cracking bilateral. So the question is, is this just sinus tachycardia from fever or not? In an observational study with infants, they have seen that every decrease of temperature increase, there's an increase of uh, heart rate with 10 beats per minute in infants between 2 and 12 months. So if the uh, infant has a 40 degrees uh, temperature, so his uh, heart uh, rate can also decrease. If you look at the mechanism of the tachycardia, then we should say there's a re-entry in most cases, enhanced automaticity, and triggered dysrhythmia. If we look at, at our differential diagnosis of narrow complex tachycardia, then we can say if there's a P wave present, think of sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter, AV NRT. AVRT or focal atrial tachycardia. If you don't see any P wave, think of AVRT, AVNRT, and a junction of tachycardia. AVNRT and AVRT are not always that easy to distinguish. So, AVNRT, AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Is the most common paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. It has a dual AV nodal physiology with two separate conduction pathways in the AV node, a fast pathway and a slow pathway. That allows for re entry circuit in an AV node. Atrioventricular re entry tachycardia, there's an accessory pathway and uh, tracks of conduction tissue outside of AV node connecting atria and ventricle. There's a re-entry circuit formed by exterior pathway and AV node, and two or more separate exterior pathways. In the sheet, a typical AV NRT is in 90 to 95% of the cases, with the anterograde conduction down stone pathway and a retrograde conduction up to the fast pathway. 
the atypical AVRT is the reverse of what we have seen in the picture above us. AVRT, there are two types of X-ray pathway, namely concealed and manifest. By concealed, there is a it is capable of retrograde conduction only, and by manifest that allows retrograde and retrograde conduction. Here we see an ECG where the EQ time is very short, less than 120. We can see a delta wave, and we can see a white grist complex. But it's a, it's a exterior pathway, and in this case. It should be left lateral. There are three excitation syndromes. One of them is the wolf parkinson white. On the ECG, we can see a PR less than 120 milliseconds, a QRS more than 100 milliseconds, and a delta wave in some leads. The syndrome is low, just only high. The PR time is less than 120 milliseconds and the QRS is normal. There is an intranodal or paranodal fiber that bypass all of the part of the atrioventricular node. VPV and SVT. There can be an autodromic or an antrodromic uh, conduction. By autodromic SVT, there is an anterograde conduction of AV and the third X ray track. It uses normal conduction system, that's why the tachycardia is small, narrow. An anterodromic uh, superconductive tachycardia, there is an anterograde conduction from A to ventricle through X ray pathway and retrograde flow through the AV node. That's why the complexes are white. In this case, we should avoid AV blockers. So, use prochnomide or cardiovert. BPV and AFEP. It is irregular white complex tachycardia, also called FBI, fast broad irregular. It is commonly seen and potentially life threatening. There can be a one to one conduction which can get PF. In this case, do not give AV blocking medication. Use prochnomide or cardiovert. So, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Ismail. As you said it, we should not try to use any beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So, we should try to uh, use as more of uh, antiarrhythmic medicine, right? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Pronastil is uh, the first choice. And if the patient is unstable, always cardiovert. Wonderful summary indeed. Thank you. The prediction of sudden cardiac death in VPV, uh, uh, you should look at the RR interval. If the RR interval is less than 250 milliseconds, or patient has a history of symptomatic tachycardia or multiple X-ray pathways, or an epsilon anomaly, then it can be a predictor of sudden cardiac death. It is easily set for uh, in the cat lab. Uh, if it is an AV NRT or AVRT, but on the ECG it can be difficult. Uh, there are some clues. If you see a pseudo R in V1, it can be AV NRT. Also, pseudo S in 2, 3, or AVF, that can be an uh, AV NRT. If you see ST elevation in AVR, or RP more than 100 milliseconds, or ST depression more than 2 millimeters, that could be AVRT. So the bottom line of this slide is that the ECG is not 100%, but it can be helpful in diagnosing and treatment. What should we do in an acute situation? If the patient is unstable, 
X, cardioverted patient. If the patient is stable, then you can do a vagal maneuver, give adenosine or calcium channel blockers. These are uh, class 1 level of evidence A. <clears throat> if you don't have this medication or, uh, or it doesn't help enough, you can give beta blockers, amiodarone or digoxine. But these are level class 2B, level of evidence C. Before cardioversion, it's important to give the uh, patient sedation and you should choose your uh, level of uh, energy and that can be a uh, variable and don't forget to uh, put the device on synchronized uh, defibrillation otherwise you can get EF. So, to conclude, adenosine can convert uh, some uh, PTs when we think of a uh, SVT with aberrancy, adenosine can also convert neurocomplex tachycardia or can help us with the diagnosis. If, this, if there's a white and irregular uh, tachycardia, think of BPV and AFib. In that case, give no medication that will block the AV node. Amiodrone can be given, not if ideal, you should give trochanamide. That's the first choice. Option. If you give adenosine, then you should give it fast. Then after that, uh, saline. So, look if the uh, needle is functioning well and give the patient the adenosine. You can give 3, 6, 9, 12 milligrams. In my hospital, to be honestly, I will start if a patient has a normal uh, waist, 6 milligrams, after that 12, and then 18 milligrams. And that's the standard recommendation as well. That's really nice to know, actually. Yes. And uh, it is also said that the center line has a higher success than a peripheral line, and that the higher dosage has more success rates than the lower dosages. But in the ACLS, it is, it, uh, it is said that you should start with 6 milligrams, then twice 12 milligrams. The FDA approves only to 12 milligrams, but in the literature, there are also cases to 25 milligrams. So normally you can give till uh, 25 milligrams. Okay. The second choice of medication is uh, calcium uh, channel blockers. You should always be aware of the patient is already using um, um, uh, calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. In the second uh, case, if the patient uses uh, beta blockers, you should not give uh, more than 2.5 mg. Uh, if it's not, then you can give 2.5 mg or 5 mg intravenous in two minutes. The second dose. 30 minutes later, can be 2.5 mg to 10 mg. It's contraindicated in infants, white cures, hypertensive patients, heart failure patients, or uh, patients with uh, wolf parks and white. So you can also give Diltiazem, as you can see the dosages and the contraindications are the same as uh, Perapamil. Let's look at this case. There's a 78 year old female with uh, narrow uh, complex tachycardia, history of uh, paroxysmal tachycardia. Patient had severe side effects of adenosine, previously refuses repeating of that. Not want to be shocked either. What can you do? You can give the patient other medication like parapamil, beta blocker. Picoxin, but in this case, the patient has a low blood pressure, 88 to 65 minutes of mercury. Mm -hmm. What can you do? Yeah, in indeed, uh, it's a very, very uh, typical and very common scenario, and I think it's a very 
Um, interesting question, especially for the audience to think about it actually. So I think yeah. Dr. Ismail can, Dr. Ismail can share his experience, what needs to be done for such cases. Okay. In, a, in this case, if you want to give medication, propamol is not uh, the case because you have hypertension, beta blockers are not uh, a good case. You can use uh, lanoxin, digoxin otherwise, or if the patient has hypertension, then you can say, okay, patient is symptomatic and unstable and you can cardiovert it. So, in my opinion, you can give digoxina a half milligram, or if you say, I don't have any medication to give to the patient, you can uh, cardiovert this patient. In uh, the most cases, yeah, there's a treatment, a chronic treatment. The drugs that should be used are calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, digoxin, other antiarrhythmics, fill in the pockets, just like Diltiazem uh, and propanolol. Um, if the patient uh, has more than one uh, episode of supraventricular tachycardia, an EP can be done. In some cases, the success rate is more than 90%, but that's, uh, that's not always. If you have a KV NRT, a flutter, then the success rate is high. If you have atrial fibrillation, then it depends on the left atrium size and in the best uh, and in the best position, maybe the success rate will be uh, 60 to 70 percent in uh, atrial fibrillation patients. But uh, patients with a re-entry tachycardia, the success rate rate uh, can be up to 95 percent. So, take home messages. Uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is a heterogeneous grouping of arrhythmia, so just like an umbrella. If it, the patient is unstable, cardiovert, adenosine is the choice of treatment for stable uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. It can also help you with the diagnosis. Avoid AV blockers in any. Uh, quite uh, complex tachycardia or irregular rhythm, which is uh, wide. BPV has a small but definite risk of sudden cardiac death. Relation techniques are, in some cases, more than 90% curative and can help the patient with their complaints and uh, their arrhythmia. If you think of that, I think you should uh, consult Dr. Narendra Kumar. Thank you for your attention, uh, and I wish you a very nice uh, Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ismail. We really appreciate uh, taking all your time, especially from your busy schedule, to have it for us and sharing your views and especially talking in such a lucid, very clear, easy to understand approach, especially uh, you also try to show us a lot of those case scenarios as well in which we can try to use those medicines and all. Thank you so much and uh, I'm really looking forward to hope to see you soon sometimes in person and of course in future we would love to have you here and maybe if possible do some cases as well for the benefit of all of us. Thank you so much, really. Thank you. Uh, it was an honor uh, to uh, speak in front of you. Um, I also hope to see you in person. And uh, I wish you all of you a nice uh, congress. And uh, like I said, if I have any patient who should get an, an EP study, I would recommend Dr. Narendra Kumar, who is a very good friend of mine and uh, who I want to recommend as a very good uh, EP specialist. Uh, Dr. Smile is always so kind and sweet. Thank you so much. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Greetings from the Netherlands. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, so now I'll stop the recording.